So I first had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Uh, Catherine Zeisner uh, a few months ago in Winnipeg. That was also about 40 degrees Celsius ago. Uh, so it was a great, uh, great experience at that conference and uh, very inspiring. Um, yeah, Catherine has done some great work. She's a, an assistant professor at Gonzaga University in Spokane, working with uh, master's students and doctoral students. Uh, and the research we have and she's done is amazing and has given us some guiding principles on uh, where we can go with this technology and what our, what our real goals are. Uh, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Catherine Zeisner. Hello friends. For the next uh, 35 minutes, but not to spoil it, uh, I want to begin with the end in mind. I want you to grow like a lobster. Yes, if you take anything away from my time today, I want you to grow and be like a lobster. I am very proud to illuminate the findings of this Microsoft Commission study conducted with McKinsey entitled The Class of 2030. I have an example here, and at the end, I have the link where you can download it yourself. I know this sounds really far out, 2030, but these students are sitting in grade one today, and they're going to graduate into a world that is changing faster than ever. It's going to be a generation that will face challenges into a world that we don't even can't even imagine what it's going to be like. They're going to, to learn and engage with each other with technology and with information in entirely new ways. This study, um, they study post-secondary school courses that might not even exist today and enter a workforce transformed by automation. Please allow me to showcase some of the themes and data found in the research so that you can help prepare the 21st century workforce for our future. What brought me here today is a very serendipitous meeting on an airplane with a fantastic educator from Microsoft, but I'm actually an elementary school principal from London, Ontario, and very proud of that. Uh, but I moved just recently in August to Spokane to now be able to teach in higher ed. Um, I'm also a huge failure, and I embrace failure more than anything, and I'm very, very proud of every stumble that I've had in my life and career that's obviously led me to be here today. I am uh, here to share with you that anything is possible if we have the right people in the right room at the right time with the right intentions. I am very commonly known as the lobster lady. You may be wondering why there is a lobster involved in a conversation about preparing for the class of 2030. Well, did you know the lobster is an animal that has really resonated with me my entire life because it's helped me become the person you see before you today. I actually spent three years studying lobsters for my doctorate and how they relate to education. Yes, they are linked because the lobster is a wonderful example of how to overcome challenges, difficulties, and adversities. Did you know that they are an extremely resilient animal? I'm gonna show you how you can grow and lead like a lobster to be the best wherever you lead and serve, and especially to help those who are gonna be supporting the class of 2030. This transition is going to be very difficult for some educator stakeholders because it's going to be a complete change of potential practice, environment, and most importantly, mindset. There is a lot of great news associated with the class of 2030, and the best is the students told us what they want. The 21st century workforce is, can be fully prepared for jobs and have a She speaks very well. of skills that the 21st century workforce needs and how we can best prepare them 
and the promising role that technology plays in their success. This cutie was a very difficult student in the 70s and 80s, not able to focus, staring out of windows all day, hating everything taught to her. She was only successful in gym class, bored only loving recess, which is she got close to the boys, uh, loved harmonics and shop classes, couldn't memorize, copy from a board, do math minutes. Being very tall for her age, she had to sit in the back of the classroom and wasn't engaged in any of the lessons. But she had the power of the lobster behind her and overcame multiple forms of adversity, from cancer to job loss, and stronger because of it, surprising not only herself, but others along the way. Obviously, this beauty is me in grade one in London, Ontario. Um, the exact same age as our class in 2030. Boy, have times changed, or have they? In constructing the research, uh, data was gathered from 70 global thought leaders, review of 150 pieces of prior research, engaged over, 20, over 2,000 students and 2,000 teachers from Canada, Singapore, the United States, and the United Kingdom in 2017. It explored outcomes such as attitudes about teaching and learning experiences, relationships, and the use of technology to support learning. Most importantly, it focused on the young people who would make up the class of 2030. What are their aspirations, experiences, and expectations of us? Education, we know, is in a constant state of flux, and it's responding to global changes that are occurring across societies and economies. Educators navigate decision-making against the backdrop of information that's arriving at an unprecedented volume, variability, and velocity. Within this setting, the class of 2030, they graduated to jobs that have not even yet been created, technologies that have not yet been imagined, and opportunities to solve social and global challenges that have not yet been this research reveals new insights into the voices of today's learners and what they themselves consider the critical elements of learning that will make them life ready and work ready. The students surveyed were very, very clear. They want choice and control over their learning and expect their opinions to be heard. They want to be supported by educators who know and understand them as individuals. The future of learning is going to be profoundly social personalized and supported by technology. The overarching theme of the research is that it's about learners and learning. The students were clear. They want to develop the skills to navigate their own learning, to explore to make choices that unlock their curiosity and potential. And most importantly, they want you to understand them and care for them. This generation expects to have a voice they expect to be heard and able to direct and navigate their own learning. Within the overall context of student centricity, we found two core themes social, emotional skills, and personalized learning. In social learning, students want collaboration towards purpose because collaborating and interacting with others propels learning. Teaching others helps students learn deeply, so students learn best when they are surrounded by positive peer groups and strong relationships with educators promote student learning and well-being. For, for emotional learning, it's where students learn to manage their mindsets for success and where their attitudes and motivation have a large impact on their performance. For personalized learning, it's where we are promoting an effective closed learning gap for instruction that is tailored to the pace and background of each learner, which will help with their while certainly not new to education, these are newly important to more people and are taking center stage with cognitive and content knowledge in the classroom and the workplace. The analysis highlighted that strong social emotional learning is twice as predictive of a student's success, more so than home environment and demographics. I have to say it again social emotional skills are two times as predictive of a student's academic success than as their home environment or their demographics. And the science backs it up. Neuroscientists know that emotion is the gatekeeper to cognition, so social emotional skills are fundamental for all learning. And it's very crucial in the workplace because we know 30 to 40% of the jobs in growth industries will require explicit social emotional skills. 
As we look to the workforce, this may be the most human generation yet, as automation replaces repetition tasks, and new jobs will place a premium on these skills. The research confirms numerous study findings that complex, problem solving, and critical thinking and creativity continue to be the top cognitive skills. A survey of employers and youth done by McKinsey indicated that only 42% of employers and 45% of students felt that they were adequately prepared for the workforce with a particular gap around their social emotional skills. So here it is. These are the five things our future learning environments need to have. One, that it's competency based with a focus on mastery and readiness. Two, that we allow for learner agency, which creates the conditions for students choose to make choices and act upon them individually and collectively with a high degree of self-drive and intrinsic motivation. Three, that it's socially embedded, where there are relationships within and beyond the classroom that drive learning. Fourth, that it's open walled, which invite experiences outside of the classroom in, whether it's global, local, or digital, into the value of learning and connects the learner to the world. And lastly, that it's personalized, which means that it's student-centered focus that takes into account their prior knowledge, their motivation, and their intentions to develop skills and knowledge to guide the release of responsibility to the learner. So this is my favorite, favorite picture it's from OECD. It's how they use um, a very simple model called KSA, Knowledge, Skills, and Attitude, uh, to drive a competency which gives people an action. I've seen this many times, and most importantly, I learned about it when I was a teacher, and a principal sat me down to do a performance appraisal. And she had a sheet of paper in front of her and three columns. And at the top of each column, she had the letter K, S, and M. And she wanted to very um, calmly and respectfully give me some feedback about how I was as a teacher in order to show me some gaps, which would then drive me to be more confident and to have better action. So she listed all this great knowledge that I had, oh, yeah. student learning, pedagogy. She talked about all kinds of great skills that I had as a teacher. But then they said that my attitude sucked. I wasn't really collegial. I wasn't very supportive of change. I was a little bit of a negative Nelly at staff meetings. And so she was able to show me that that column was a big gap for me. And while that conversation hurt, and it hurt for a long time, it was truthful. And so once a spotlight was put on that gap, that A piece, and I changed my attitude towards my colleagues, and about being more collaborative, and opening up my door and people in, I was, I've been much more successful. I want you to, for a second, think of any problem that you are currently involved in. And just take a second and imagine a three-column sheet with K, S, A at the top. And which one of those is where you have the gap that's really stopping you from solving the problem? I want to give you three examples. So one of the things I'm constantly trying to do is move it. So why wouldn't I go to my KSA competency chart to see if there's any way that I can continue to be healthier and what chunk of that is missing in order for me to be able to speak? Well, under the knowledge column, I have a ton of knowledge about how to lose weight. Calories in versus calories out, drink lots of water, exercise more, sleep better. I have a ton of skills related to losing weight. I know how to work out, I know how to cook well, but I don't want to. <laughs> so once again, that A problem. <laughs> so speaking of, <laughs> once again, unless you are prepared, you're not going to be successful. So once you get into that great routine and you have some people who are inspiring and that attitude call is stronger, then you become more competent. Let me give you a second example. Many years ago, I decided I wanted to run a marathon. So I thought, I'm going to use my KSA chart to see where the gaps are and what I need to know. So I had a great attitude about it. I'm going to do this. Nobody's going to stop me. Big people can run too. I'm turning 40. I had all kinds of knowledge about how to run a marathon. 42.2 kilometers. It's hard. Your feet get sore. But I had absolutely no skills because I wasn't like a track person in high school. I could shot hard. That kind of stuff. 
So I joined um, a running club, and you might have them here, called the Running Room. Yeah, and they can take a course on how to learn how to run, which is shocking. You know, you know how to run, but you don't know how to run as well. And so the Running Room teaches you a variety of skills called the 10 in 1 method, where you run for 10 minutes, walk for one minute, run for 10 minutes, walk for one minute, and you can run forever doing that. You can run forever and just run slowly. And so I was lucky enough to be very successful in completing their 10K clinic. And on, I don't know, December 31st, 2009, I ran a 10K race. And I finished last. Oh, it was embarrassing, but I didn't care because I finished. And I thought, I'm getting some great skills here. The running room then offers a half marathon to learn the run club. So my friends and I joined that clinic. And a half marathon is 21.1 kilometers. Again, you do your 10 in one running in the race. And in April 2010, I ran a run for retina race in London, Ontario, and I finished a half marathon. And again, I was last with like 500 runners. But let me tell you why being last in a race is awesome. <laughs> One is when you're last, all the medical personnel and the police officers are on their bicycles behind you in your own personal cheering section. <laughs>
And so once I had the opportunity to get all kinds of great information from the Canadian Cancer Society, to get a mentor, I had fantastic surgeons and support, I was able to then be very, very successful and feel fantastic. And I think seven years later, I am now cancer and feeling fantastic. This This works every time. I highly recommend if you have a student or something in your life that you're really struggling and you're really trying to call themselves, literally sit down and make a KSA chart and discover where it is that you need to put your focus and then put all your energy there. So we know that students now need learner agency as our second really fantastic environmental place. Um, we want them to exercise agency in their own education and their own life. Agency implies a sense of responsibility to participate into the world and to influence people, but that's for the better. But agency requires the ability to frame a guiding purpose of actions. Therefore, we must not only recognize learners in the job, but take into account the wider set of relationships that our learners are working with. Yeah. Their peers, their families, their communities, and how that influences their learning. The concept underlying learner agency is the cool agency. In fact, mutually supportive relationships that learners progress towards their value goals. And I know you've all experienced learners who've had no agency. Um, this is also not only for students, but fantastic for educators, leaders, parents, and members of our community. Factors that help learners enable agency is a personalized learning environment that supports and motivates each learner to nurture their passions, make contributions between learning experiences and opportunities, and make connections to their learning desires. We want them to make projects and collaborate with others to solve a foundation of literacy found and a foundation of literacy and literacy. Does anybody recognize this amazing work? This particular Olympian, who you may or may not know, is named Damian Warner. Damian Warner is from London, Ontario. He is a two-time Olympian and a bronze medalist in the decathlon. And it's not about you're winning Olympics or going Olympia. You know how many years they work to aspire at one thing. This particular person, because he's a decathlon, decathlon, but just needs to excel in ten different athletic events. Here, for the ultimate athlete at the end. Picturing what um, in 2020 he will be coming and going for his third Olympics. So I hope that we will cheer him on. But let me tell you why it's very important that you know who Damian Warner is. Before he was Damian Warner Olympian, always looked over by Damian Warner. He's the little gentleman beside me in the photo. You can see that he has grown and come into his beautiful figure and athleticism over the years. He was a great seven student of mine at Sir John McDonald in London, Ontario. Very quiet, very studious, wonderful young man from a beautiful family who just had it. He had that athletic prowess. Track day, he'd win everything. I remember him running the 100 meter final and looking back at all of the people, not confident, not copy in any way, but in that sense of confidence. Um, what's also fantastic is the Olympics were on when I was her teacher. This is actually a picture of us watching the Olympics. Uh, the irony of me having this photo of this young man. What's really awesome is one of the things that I did annually, and still to this day do with every class that I have, including my master's and doctoral students, is I have them write a 10 year letter. I give them the opportunity in January of every year to write themselves in the future. I don't read the letters, I just give them the opportunity to reflect and write, and then I collect the letters and I put them in my basement. And over the years, I have a variety of shoeboxes that are dated at the end of the 10 years. I mail the letters out to the students. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity, because it was Damien's 10 year letter year, to present to him his letter. I was invited to um, a place where he was speaking, a school where he was speaking. And I had found his letter in my basement, and I personally wanted to provide it to him. So it was wonderful to see him and to congratulate him on his wonderful life and career. And unbeknownst to me, he decided to open the letter and read it in front of all the students that he was presenting to. I had never seen the letter. I had no, never seen any of the students' letters, nor had ever been there when any of them had ever opened them. And when Damien opened his, it indicated that he was going to be an Olympian. And I just about 
because I thought how important it is as educators that we continue to give students the opportunity to dream and dream big, but then close the circle by having the opportunity to go back and reflect on some of those dreams and goals we did. I was not only thrilled for him that he in grade seven had been that bravery to seek such a lofty goal, but I was so happy for this family that they had given him all of that support in order to seek and to have these great opportunities, if you will. So I, I implore you, in the Olympics next summer, please, please, please cheer for Damian Warner and the Catholic, because he is so worth our time and energy, because he's been such a wonderful motivator for so many students in London. Thirdly, we talked about that our, our environment is socially embedded. Chris Colwell reminds us that learning is a fundamentally social process and that culture is built upon relationships between students, students and educators, students and the community. This relationship can only occur in a modern context if we can move with the facility conditions that are already in our pages. Innovation springs not only from individual thinking and working alone, but through cooperation and collaboration with others to draw on existing knowledge. This construct that underpins the competency includes adaptability, creativity, curiosity, and open-mindedness. For our fourth being open walls, Yao and Amen in their article Redesigning High Schools, they state to truly create a school of the future, schools need an open-world approach that incorporates rich and highly flexible learning resources that are only available outside of the classroom. This includes mentors, workplace internships, opportunities to pursue interest-based learning at community institutes or online. The schools must support and create opportunities for feedback groups that ties academic <coughs> achievement to students' personal passions and to opportunities to contrib contribute in the real world. In short, schools need to be designed from the inside out and the outside in. So let me tell you why this is important. <coughs> So I was a vice principal of a school in London, Ontario, a beautiful school, and I had a fantastic secretary assistant who was just a wonderful person. She and I had a very clear relationship that I could tell the kind of problem that had come to the counter of the school by the way that she said my name. So I would be in my office and I would there say, oh, Catherine, can you come to her? Oh, and I would know it's the same thing coming for registration or uh, Mrs. Leiser, I would know there's been an injury and I need to sort of brush. But on one particular day, the way she said my name was no other way I've ever heard her say before. Something about, Mrs. Leiser, we need your help. And I thought, we, well, it's only you and I, so what's the problem? As I left my office and came to the counter where she sat, there was a gentleman who had a ride and he was holding a leash. And all of a sudden, this giant beast stood up and put its paws on the desk. And I was face to face with something I had never seen before in my entire life. This giant furry marsupial was staring down and the secretary said to me, this gentleman would like to take his animal around to the classrooms to, in, to introduce it to the students because he's opening a new petting zoo in London. And I sort of had a little bit of a heart attack. I knew there was a policy about having wise animals in the classroom, but I'm sure it was about the fact that it had to be smaller than a box of Kleenexes. And this marsupial was probably the kindness. As I turned to go back to my office to get the policy, the live animal in the classroom policy, all of a sudden I hear the gentleman go, whoops. And I turn back, he has dropped the leash. And the marsupial. <laughs> is now in this <laughs> So I immediately see the headline on uh, Vice Principal Murderous Marsupial in the classroom. Um, and I said something to the gentleman I thought I would never say as a school educator, which was, you know, go get your cane in the room. <laughs> and this is a beautiful school. It's not a little bit of a circle with a library in the middle. So as the people were around in the corner, you couldn't see it anymore. See. But I could see the guy chasing it. I'm chasing after the guy as Mrs. Kubiak 
kindergarten class is coming from the gym, walking towards me and all, and I'm going to get the finger on the lip, and I'm like, this kangaroo is going to kill one of these children. <laughs> so, thank goodness, it's right around the corner, the gentleman is coming back with the kangaroo on a leash, and I'm like, get out of my school. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my heart is racing, I told you I saw the headline in the newspaper. But the kid, I wanted to make sure that the children were okay because they're walking down the hall on that corner. And I'm checking to make sure they have all of their faculties. A little almond, who was my favorite, of course, looks up at me and says, Mrs. Eisner, did you see the giant rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, almond, and make sure you tell your mom it was a giant rabbit. <laughs> 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 Go back to the office, Heather is there, and you see the gentleman leaving with the mustard in his hand. And I thought to myself, the irony of him not knowing that's a kangaroo, but him assuming it's a rabbit. And I, I was pleased he was going to go on to rabbit. But I thought, what are we doing in our schools if children aren't fully aware of all of the wonderful things that are existing? So it's an example of how important the overall, figuratively and literally, is to all of our students. And finally, personalized learning opportunities. These accelerate academic and cognitive growth. In a study analyzed from Microsoft, students in schools using personalized learning experiences made greater progress across two years with significant effects in math and literacy. Multiple studies prove that students who receive personalized instruction outperform 98% of traditionally taught students. In addition to cognitive grades, these personalized learning models provide opportunities to develop social and emotional skills strong senior agency at a time. So, what is the technology that's going to support our five fantastic educational environmental changes? It's really important that we are able to provide new ways for teachers and learners to engage in learning that builds on student interests, provides insights around strengths and partial social emotional skills. We know that certain technologies can allow teachers 20% to 30% of their time back to do things that they feel are much more relevant. Potentially, this reallocation of time could, look, could leave the technology to deepen personalized learning and development into our social emotional skills. Such awesome new technologies are able to reallocate teachers' time by organizing large amounts of content and data. New processing allows for highly personalized and targeted creation. And some are allowing educators to find on-demand content and co-create assets with crowdsourcing between educators. Lastly, there are some new technologies that are allowing for automation of grading and providing virtual tutors to ensure students are staying on track. I love this set of slides because it shows us how far we've come from the projector. The internet has only been around since the 90s, the same as interactive web words. Smartphones came into our lives in 2000, along with the addition of collaborative platforms. Technology has existed for a long time, while apps and education continue to be developed. We see cool apps now being used to engage families through communication, track formative assessment, allow the world to enter into our learning spaces, and our students to explore the world. <laughs> These three technologies are the ones that were highlighted through this study as being the ones that will provide us with personalized learning and social emotional skill development. The three technologies we expect to do this are artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality, and collaborative platforms. Many of the things that are already as part of some of the wonderful sessions. Over a half an hour. The potential lies in their ability to amplify and extend what makes us human. From the World Economic Forum, technology can personalize learning, engage the disengaged, complement what happens in the classroom and extend education outside of it. And it provides access to learning of students who have otherwise been not sufficient. So what is the call of action using for the 21st century workforce? Educators, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate with other educators to create a pilot program <laughs> to explicitly address social emotional learning and leverage digital communities to provide students safe spaces to explore their identity and to learn to make responsible choices. Educational leaders, model, model, 
model to staff personalized learning experiences and identifying social and emotional skills to creating a culture rich that sets the vision and direction for your environments. Introduce and engage all staff to online communities, which is a powerful way to build and understand social context. Next, enhance educators' professional development with flipped and blended learning, which allows for educators to individualize their own piece, entry points in learning, and training. And please be on the front end of how to use technology, which we know can motivate, manage, and promote autonomous learning. Promote innovation in teaching and learning by providing time, resources, and opportunities to our staff. Leaders, system leaders, and district leaders. Provide, provide, provide. Opportunities for school leaders and educators to explore current and emerging technologies and the role they play in developing the 21st century learner. Prioritize social emotional skills and personalized learning high on your agendas in order to maximize their benefits. Identify schools that are already successfully piloting programs, gather data from them for deep analytics to determine their impact, and this rich data set will demonstrate their impact, trends, and spot best practices. We know that accessibility and inclusion features heavily in personalization. Accessibility features like dictation and text decoding are helping students with all abilities to improve reading, writing, and comprehension, especially those wanted by students who we know have a learning difference. For example, learning tools such as dictation suites help students with all abilities to write more easily by using their voice and immersion readers offer support in all languages. Promising work is being taken around a set of systems and devices that can recognize, interpret, and process human emotional responses. Projects being run out of MIT include machine learning models to model learner well-being, promoting kindness and persuasive technology. There are apps, websites, bots with intelligent algorithms to see, hear, and speak and understand and interpret through natural methods of communication. We can now detect emotions in photos, and these emotions are understood to be cross-cultural and in universally communicated facial expressions. Powered by the cloud, learning environments are now profoundly social in their orientation, and the results which bring a demand for technology, cognitive, social, and emotional skills to navigate their environments. Any platform which brings young people together in real time with an opportunity to develop and apply, and apply their cognitive skills, increasing their communication and problem solving. The fundamental challenge for schools and systems is to get actionable insight of data. The cloud now enables compute and storage at very low cost. The opportunities to connect contrast of data sets, and we're able to better understand status and predict outcomes. The sudden growth and popularity of AI is that it's enabling new scenarios with direct outcomes and availability of large volumes of data to be read and stored. School districts are now using predictive analytic data in order to determine how their students will have success indicators, and some school boards have already increased graduation from 55 to 83 percent. Experiences on the reality spectrum provide learners experiences that engage their senses and emotions in ways which were not previously accessible. Neuroscience is unlocking the mysteries of how and where our bodies process emotion. This unique melding of biology and psychology of emotion promises to suggest powerful economic applications. Augmented reality will promote social learning through experiences and situations outside of the student's current lived experience. Has anyone ever seen a Minecraft club in action? And lastly, our spotlight is on your collaborative platforms, which provide authentic learning environments that are very socially involved. For example, new platforms provide a space for the staff in the classroom where people need to develop norms and rules to rehearse how to engage in shared spaces. Collaboration matters because it's where we transfer knowledge from our short term to our long term memories. It's how we retain knowledge, make connections, and deepen learning. To collaborate effectively, we must be able to self regulate, and to self regulate, we must have a great foundation of social emotional skills. Personalized learning is supported through platforms to share assignments with students. Educators we know now can post to individuals, to groups. They can 
can tailor assignments to each individual in their writer's classrooms. They can provide continuous feedback and that loop of feedback, better feedback, better feedback, better. And now their submissions can be continually improved even after the teacher leaves feedback. Therefore, the future of education is here with our three spot-mounted technologies, AI, virtual and augmented reality, and collaborative platforms. The class of 2030 can be fully prepared for the workforce and have improved well-being by allowing for deep social and emotional skill development if we provide collaborative platforms. Ensuring we are building and supporting learning environments rich in global competencies, learner agency that they're socially embedded, open wall, and tailored to personalized mm -hmm. learning experiences. And the technology can support our learners with developing these skills to help educators create these experiences Teachers and love create kind for much more value added activities. The kinds of differences that provides for success for our tomorrows today. This takes hours. So, in conclusion, while no one's dream has been easy, mine has had multiple bumps along the way. Job interviews blown, rough performance appraisals, learning to collaborate with some very challenging partners, moving through eight locations in my school board, being moved from a job that I love, stupid cancer diagnosis, community difficulties, and further ups and downs that took the toll but did not deteriorate. This bumpy journey led me to want to explore school leadership and its challenges. Often in my, in my career, I have felt that my challenges were because I was a failure, failed or was a bad leader. I was fascinated with how other people faced challenges and what they did to move past them and still met with such grace and skill. I had seen college and colleagues have to manage the death of a student, financial scandal, community revolts, media disrespect, and wondered if they too felt and reflected on these incidents as failures or bad leadership. And these colleagues were a lot stronger, better, and smarter than I am. My doctoral research examined how people manage leadership adversity, what supports are available to them, professional learning and programs to develop in the role, and specifically, how can you not feel like a failure? Well, the great news is, is I found out. Strong educators do three things to overcome adversity. They model three specific resiliency strategies. First, they have a positive mindset, and they're able to tap into that strength regularly. Second, they do something physical, walk, yoga, garden, swim. And thirdly, they confide in a trusted colleague in a similar role. You can actually predict which leaders can be successful if you ask them, what are your resiliency strategies? Look around this room of amazing people here who are here to impact thousands and thousands of students, <laughs> educators, stakeholders, and people that they support. You know who is outstanding because they are positive, physically active, and reach out to others when they need support. As I mentioned earlier, I suffered great pride if you refer to me as the lobster lady. I've learned through my research that it's not the lion, the tiger, or the bear that is the mighty beast when it comes to leadership, but actually the beautiful lobster that provides us the biggest lessons. Rabbi Dr. Tversky explains that lobsters are soft, mushy animals who live inside of a rigid shell. That shell does not expand. Well then, how does the lobster grow? As the lobster matures, its shell becomes very refining, and the lobster feels itself under pressure and uncomfortable. Well, it casts off that shell, and it grows a new one. And eventually, that shell becomes very uncomfortable as it grows, and so the lobster must repeat this growing and casting off of its shell numerous times throughout its life. The stimulus for the lobster to be able to grow is that it feels under pressure, confined, and uncomfortable. Therefore, to link this metaphor to today, moving forward to support the class of 2030 and beyond may be challenging, overwhelming, uncomfortable, and difficult. But if we can acknowledge our potentially bumpy ride ahead, we can recognize that difficult times are also times for signals for growth and change. And I know we all agree that not only the class of 2030 but our educators, families, and communities we support. So close up. Who's with me? <laughs> Thank you 
so much for that. That was um, a lot that I could relate to. I am a graduate. Oh, congrats. My master's degree it was an incredible experience to be a part of that cohort. Um, I appreciated your knowledge, skills, attitude chart. That was a good reflection. And sharing your personal stories. Um, I've only been able to do one marathon. Yeah. I still don't have the courage yet to do another. Yeah, that's hard. But the great cafeteria section behind you. I can relate. I can relate. And a sore feet. And it's like the life journey in life. We get sore feet. We have we, we build crowds of support behind us and help push us forward. I never thought I would be in the presentation of a talk about kangaroos and lobsters. It was a great metaphor. So I appreciate you sharing your knowledge. Um, you seem to cap off all of the great learnings we've had in the last couple of days, um, tying in the core competencies and the social emotional strengths that we need in our students. So thank you for that. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Uh, okay, the walls are going to go up 12.15 for lunch back here. Uh, as soon as you're seated and the last person gets their lunch, or maybe just before, we're going to kick off right away and we're going to run this agenda this afternoon as quick as possible to get you home. So thanks everyone. Uh, session started at 10. Check out the vendors, etc. Walls are going up, so be careful as you go by. Okay.